Hi, I'm K.L. Kettle. Welcome to episode four of the Book Chain Project. This week, Beth and Evans interviews Dave Cousins, and there's some really interesting uh, talk about uh, process and about uh, experiences of uh, working and writing for children and working with an illustrator. And I really hope you enjoy it. Don't forget to subscribe and share and like, and we'll see you in, uh, two weeks from now because we have a bit of a break. Bye for now. Good evening and welcome to episode four of the Book Chain Project. Just to start off this week's, I would like to begin by saying there may be spoilers as we go through and discuss the books and the storylines, um, just to make you aware. And equally, we can't stop to respond to any comments or answer any questions as the live video will be being recorded for YouTube and to be made into podcasts. I'm Bethan Evans and I'm the author of the young adult novel Necropolis, which was published earlier this year and is available on Amazon. Last week I was interviewed by Claire Helen Walsh, who is the author of children's picture books, including Lenny the Lemur series, and that interview is now available as a podcast or on YouTube. And tonight I will be interviewing Dave Cousins, who is the author of the Robot Babysitters series for young readers, including My Robot's Gone Wild, which I've just finished reading and we're going to be discussing tonight. So I will be getting Dave to join. He should come up shortly. And where hopefully there he is, he's coming up. And welcome, Dave. Hi, Beth, and you all right? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? Yeah, yeah, good, thank you. Wonderful. So, we've got Dave as the interviewee of this week's episode of the Book Chain Project. So, before we start, if we ask Dave if you'd like to introduce yourself and your books in your own words to the people watching. Okay, right then. So, um, hello folks, um, my name's Dave Cousins. Um, my first book came out uh, about 10 years ago now, um, which feels like a very long time ago. Um, and it was this book, it, it was a teenage, teenage YA book called 15 Days Without Our Head. And um, that was a little bit of a dream come true for me, really, because I never imagined that one day I'd be published. And I must just mention that that came about because an extract from this appeared in the... Um, 2010 Undiscovered Voices anthology. So it was thanks to Undiscovered Voices um, that I actually got a book deal in the end. And Undiscovered Voices is still happening now. If you check out the uh, Scooby UK website, you can find out all about that. So um, well worth checking out that. So yeah, um, my first book came, came out, yeah, 2012. And, um, and that was for OUP. Uh, I followed that up with another kind of Team YA story um, I've done some very kind of early reader stuff um, for Collins and then I was very lucky um, OUP actually asked me to do some middle grade stuff and actually do the illustrations for it as well and um, I actually did go to art college <laughs> and uh, so getting, getting the opportunity to not only write a story but do the pictures for it as well was like a dream come true I really couldn't believe that I was getting paid to kind of sit at home and draw and write stories so I really enjoyed doing those um and most recently um i've been doing a series of books for stripes little tiger uh called the robot babysitter series including the one um beth mentioned which is my robot's gone wild and uh i've had a lot of fun with with those uh how to describe um my, my stories well i got a really nice review back in the day um for 15 days that i had um um, a, a review from uh, Beth Kemp and Beth said she described my books as teen realism with humour and heart and no one has ever kind of summed that up better and it, she summed that up much better than I ever could so that's kind of basically what I try and do with with all my stories really um, bit of realism but with some humour and heart in there as well so um, yeah that's an introduction to me wonderful thank you so much for that Dave so moving on to talk more closely about particularly my robots gone wild which say i've just finished reading and thoroughly enjoyed oh, and for me 
it had a strong sense of teamwork and about the importance of real life over game within the storyline. So that made me think about what key themes and messages do you try and include in your stories? And equally, where do the ideas for your stories come from? Um, yeah, I mean, I suppose, well, normally for me, um, I know this for something that you were talking about in your interview last week, you know, stories for me are all about characters. You know, it always starts with a character, a character in a situation. And normally, obviously, you know, for a story, we need a character in a bad situation, you know, uh, to give us the conf conflict. So it's a character kind of struggling with some something. And for instance, in uh, My Robot's Gone Wild, yeah, on one hand, it is about a bunch of friends going camping in the wilds of Scotland uh, with a robot who goes a little bit off the rails. But it's actually a story about... Um, being afraid of change. Uh, the main character, Jake, 10 year old Jake, he's, he's just finished year six and this is the summer holidays and next, next September, they're heading off to big school, which for him is terrifying, you know, and I remember that kind of change being kind of scary. And, you know, everything in Jake's world seems to be changing. Um, and he finds that really difficult to deal with, you know, his best mate is, is, is starting to kind of do his hair and care about clothes and stuff. And this is like, what's going on here, you know? And then his best mate, you know, reveals that he actually likes one of their friends and he's starting getting interested in girls. And so everything, you know, that's happening in poor Jake's life is changed and he, he's trying to just cling on to something. And, you know, that's quite, that's, that's quite hard for people to deal with. Um, so I suppose I just wanted the story to be, about, to be about that, really. And so I kind of threw Jake into this, literally into a location that was going to be alien to him and that he was going to find it very hard to deal with. And obviously through some of the stuff that happens in the story and the way that he and his best mate kind of cope with all this, it kind of works out. I suppose, I suppose what I'm trying to do with every story is, you know, you kind of, I think, you know, stories have always helped me when I was a kid and, and still now. I, I think stories help us try and make sense of the world. You know, all this kind of stuff that happens to us can be quite hard to deal with. And, and reading about somebody struggling with their life in a story has always kind of helped me, you know. Uh, either you get that bit of companionship that you can see somebody else going through it or, um, you know, just kind of seeing somebody else having a worse time than you are can sometimes help. So I suppose that's a really long way of answering your question in terms of themes and stuff. It's, you know, for me, stories are about helping us kind of deal with, with life and all the stuff that life throws at, at us. And I think when you're young, you know, you're experiencing so many things for the first time. And, you know, the world can start to seem very scary, you know, particularly when you're coming out of childhood and becoming a teenager and you realise what the, what the world's like. And I suppose, you know, all the stories that I write tend to be about that. So just kind of um, characters going through that and, and surviving it. So, um, yeah, that's where it all comes from. Yeah, that's really interesting. And the other part of My Robots Gone Wild, which I did find interesting, which... Because it's something that I'd like to do more is explore Scotland. I've only been to Edinburgh for a girls weekend. And <laughs> so intrigued me how much depth and how in much you make the reader want to go there. Whether you have any links with Scotland. <laughs> oh, I hope, I hope I'll, I'll get some money from the Scottish Tourist Tour Board now. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's strange, actually. Um, I've always, I've always had, I haven't got any kind of personal connection to Scotland uh, you know I run it now I live in Wales some of my family from Wales I've got family from Ireland you know but I've always had this I've always felt quite drawn to Scotland you know I love some of the music I love the you know the the, the language you know the, the 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 use of language and the different accents and stuff and I've um, I've been lucky enough to spend quite a lot of time in Scotland through through the books I've done a few book tours of Aberdeenshire uh, where uh, in some places they speak Doric uh, which is which is fantastic, you know, just the sound of it, and yeah, so I suppose I just yeah, I, I've just always kind of been drawn to it. I love the landscape, I love the pe people and the attitude. Um, uh, I'm, you know, I'm lucky to say I've made some friends up there, having you know travelled up there a lot. So um, yeah, but that's that's I, I suppose it's just yeah, uh, a place that I feel a kind of attachment to for some reason. Definitely nothing wrong with that, and it comes across so well in your book. Oh, good. And then, I, sorry? I was just going to say it's great to hear that it's made you want to go and go and visit. You should, definitely. Definitely. 
And then that brings me to my other question about the story and the series in general, which was the one that me and Claire discussed last week, was if you did have a robot yourself, seeing as the importance of robots in your series, <laughs> what would its priority and purpose be? Well, yeah. Yeah, tr tricky one, that. You'd imagine, because I've written all these stories about robots, that I'm a big robot fan. But actually, and I don't want to kind of spoil it for anybody here, but um, no, I, I wouldn't have a robot anywhere in the house. You know, don't trust them. The robot in the story, perhaps, because he's kind of, uh, he's, he's, quite, he's quite a human robot. Um, but robots in real life, no, I don't, know. don't, don't trust, trust them. I'm quite old fashioned, really. I collect old typewriters and stuff. I like things with cogs that you can take apart and you can see how they work. So, um, no, sorry to disappoint you on that one. Nothing wrong with that. I love losing myself with them in the books. So, can, 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 I, can I kind of flip that question back at you? Would you like to have a robot in the house? And if so, what would you have it doing? Oh, oh, that, yeah, no, it is a tricky one. <laughs> to be fair, if I had a robot, it's priority at the moment with, with lockdown and being in the house so much more, probably be to have a robot that would keep an eye on everything and, and do all the cleaning and all the odd jobs and things like that. Just have a useful one for now. Yeah, whilst, like a butler. Yeah, exactly. Whilst, we've, whilst lockdown's still keeping us at home and things more, but as restrictions lift, then one that I could go out and have some fun with as well. Yeah. That would be good too. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah. Perhaps um, one day. Oh, yes, hopefully. Then the next questions you come on to, which, again, something me and Claire discussed about myself last week, and I know a lot of the viewers would be interested because it is so varied for all writers, is about your writing process. So whether or not you're a planner or a pantser in that respect, because I personally don't do a lot of forward planning for the full plots of my books. So it was interesting in how your writing process takes take place uh in one word chaotic um <laughs> i was really pleased when i heard you say that last week actually because um yeah I'm, i i wish i could plan um i've got some really good friends who are great writers who i know plan you know to the minute detail and i'm so envious because my process is literally chaotic and it's so long-winded but I've, I've tried planning and it just doesn't work for me uh, what, what I tend to do is I just get an idea for a character or something and I just start to write and I'll explore it and you know I'll probably I'll maybe write 20,000 words 30,000 words and I just write myself into a corner get all depressed about it and you know and then I'll go back and I'll wade through this pile of nonsense and I'll find the little bit that that, that works perhaps and then I'll take that and I'll get really excited about it and I'll go off with that and I'll write another 20,000 words write myself into a corner and that's basically just what happens until I get a big mess. I, I tend to, I have what I call a vomit draft, which is like my first draft where I just put everything in, you know, and every, you know, character names change halfway through and ideas change and locations change. I just throw it all in. And I normally end up with about, you know, 80,000, 100,000 words of this just mess. And then I have to kind of brace myself and read back through it. And hopefully there'll be a, a gem of something in there. And then... This is the point, I suppose, where I do the closest that you could call planning is that I'll kind of look. <clears throat> and as I said, for me, it's always about the character. And what I, I suppose I try and identify is I, I believe that, you know, for all stories, you know, the character needs to kind of have some sort of transformative arc. You know, they need to be changed in some way by the story. So what I do try and identify is what that transformation is, you know where does this character begin the story? You know, what do they need at the start? What do they want at the start? And where do they end up? And then really kind of everything else has to be about that. It has to inform that and it has to support it. So all the other characters, every kind of event that happens, every conversation, in the back of my head, I've got this thing, okay, is this supporting this transformation? Is this kind of, you know, so, and I suppose then that starts to give me a kind of framework for it. And I'll do another massive draft and that'll be a mess again and eventually I, I, I will start to just kind of check in really I suppose to make sure that the actual story start to got you know has got an arc of sorts and there is a an identifiable midpoint and you know just kind of little I'll kind of check in and make sure that certain elements of story structure are there but 
you know, this take this is like you know draft seven or eight or whatever. So and this this take this you know is hours and hours and hours and hours of just fumbling around really. So yeah, that's my process: stumbling and fumbling around. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way of describing it though, because they were very similar on the importance of the character and how that builds the arc of the storyline. So it is a really good way to to hear it described. Yeah. So I... how long do you think? It takes you to write the book with all the fumbling and different drafts. <laughs> I, I mean, left to my own devices, years. You know, and left to my own devices, I'd, I'd probably never finish anything. Um, I need an editor to say, look, Dave, you know, we need this by this date. Um, so I do need a deadline. Because I think, you know, I'm sure you know you, yourself and any other kind of writer watching knows that, that point you get to where you can always change it. But whether that actually makes it any better um, is debatable. So I think there is a point where you just have to say, well, yeah, it could have been, it could be different. But then every story could be different. There's a point where you just have to say, well, that's what it is. And that's what it is. And I've just got to live with that now. And if I want to write a different story, then go and write that, you know. So, um, and I suppose I've learned over time that that thing that you start off with, that, that perfect idea, you know, that's, that's never going to end up on the page and you have to accept that. And I think whatever you're doing, whether it's painting, music, writing, you know, that's one of those things about creativity. You start off with this kind of perfect thing. And as soon as you commit it to, you know, to tape or to paper or to canvas, it becomes its own thing. But that's all right. And you have to kind of learn to just follow that and go with that. And this is what it is. This is what you're creating. Are you a fan of The Hunger Games, Maze Runner, Divergent or Maximum Ride? Why not try The Unadjusted's trilogy? 16-year-old Silver Melody lives in a world where 80% of the population has modified their DNA. When the president declares all Unadjusted's must take a nanite, Silver has no choice but to flee the city with her father and prevent the extinction of the Unadjusted's. But when her father is captured, Silver must band together with an unlikely group of friends and discover the secrets of her own genetic code. Yeah, the other question I had about your writing process, again, because it's something that writing for young adults, I don't have any experience with myself, mm -hmm. was working with the illustrator and also thinking about the reading experience for your readers, where they are that little bit younger, because Obviously, in My Robots Gone Wild, you've got some coloured pages and things. And the difference that made for me personally reading it to my reading experience was really interesting. And the use of illustrations. So I just, having not done it myself, wanted to ask about how you find the experience of working with an illustrator. Yeah, I, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. And it's great to hear you talk about it in that way. Because uh, obviously I did, um, you know, I've, I've done both things. I've kind of, I've been the illustrator myself, which is a different challenge. Uh, and I'm working with somebody else. At first, I wasn't sure what that would be like, but I was very lucky in the illustrator of the robot books, Catalina Echeverry was brilliant. And, um, you know, we didn't actually, we've never met. We've just kind of corresponded a few, few times. But, um, you know, when I saw the illustrations that she'd done for the first story, because obviously, you know what it's like, you know, when, you, when you're writing, you've got a very kind of firm picture of a character in your mind. And then when I saw what she'd done on paper, I was just like, wow, okay. And then when I was like getting the illustrations for the first book, I was already writing the second book. And by the time I was writing the second book, I was starting to see the characters in my head, the way that Catalina had drawn them, which for me just kind of... Um, I mean, it sounds a cliche, but it really did bring bring them to life. You know, they they kind of changed as characters because of the ways that she'd drawn them. And I think that's brilliant. And that sort of shows what great illustrations they are. And in terms of, you know, what you're talking about, which is like, yeah, there's some there's some sections that take place at night, aren't there? So, we'll find one. Uh, so we've got like kind of blacked out pages. And um, I mean, obviously, yeah, again, you know, thanks to the fantastic team at Stripes, um, who you know think about all these put you know do the layouts and everything for the books, um, and I mean that was just something you know that just adds atmosphere to it. You know I remember reading when I was a kid uh, there was a great book um, Berenstain Bears book called um, Bears Bears in the Night, and I, I remember loving you know that was all really dark and the lights and stuff and just the part of the enjoyment of that book was the atmosphere of the pages, and I suppose I'm quite visual anyway, and I think you know reading a book, you know particularly a proper book that you can sniff and you can hold in your hands is a very, you know, it's a very, it's a very physical thing. 
and you know having the fact of like that the pages suddenly go dark you know it's almost like somebody turning the lights down a bit and i think it, it just brings that much more atmosphere out and um i mean that's one of the things that i love about books is that you know the, the little tricks i suppose if you want to even call them that that you can do with illustrations and layout and I'm, I'm, I'm really interested particularly having done the illustrated books myself because there is a thing i mean you, you talk about you know writing ya but why can't there be illustrations and you know graphic stuff done in ya books i mean um, patrick ness you know the, the chaos walking series uh, they did a lot with those actually kind of, you know, with kind of having lots of text and stuff all over the pages and a number of, you know, teen and YA books have done different things with the layouts. And I think, you know, we should be able to do more of that stuff because I think, you know, reading doesn't just have to be about the words, you know, you can do stuff with layout. And I, I read a lot of graphic novels and I think, you know, again, we you know uh, perhaps trad traditional publishing could learn a lot from that in, in terms of the different ways we can use text and layout and images to tell a story so um, which is what it's all about isn't it? yeah yeah definitely i couldn't agree more in terms of reading being physical because i absolutely love getting lost in a real book as much as i do appreciate using well using an ebook and things like that for convenience though you can't beat the experience of a real book and illustrations and the difference with the pages in yours makes a world of difference with both yeah and just oh, adding that experience oh so it's, yeah. it, it's really good to hear you say that because i mean i you know i i, I love them i think stripes did a fantastic job with them so uh, now that's really nice to hear that that's that's been your response to it oh good yeah the next question i've got pulls again from conversation myself and claire had last week when we were talking about questions to ask yourself because she remembers seeing you at one of the Scooby events in around 2013-14 collecting the Crystal Kite Award and that made us have a think about can you tell us about your experience and how it's changed over the past 10 years it is since you first entered the industry and how much of a difference you're finding it now particularly with things like the pandemic and lockdown as well. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it, it was interesting kind of hearing Claire talk about being at that event. You know, obviously, I remember that event very well. And um, yeah, a long time ago now. Um, it's it's very difficult, actually, <laughs> to kind of cast my mind back to how I felt then. Um, I think, to be honest, it, it, it was kind of all a little bit of a, it sounds a cliche, but it was all a bit of a roller coaster. You know, I couldn't, I think the year before, two years before I'd been at that conference, um, unpublished and kind of dreaming of you know or not even allowing myself to dream that one day I could be published and then to be back a couple of years later to be receiving an award and you know talking you know, and I think I was on my second book there and you know that was just amazing and I, I was pinching myself and I mean that hasn't changed 10 years on I still get up and I still can't believe that I have the privilege of doing this as a job and I do feel very privileged and very lucky to be doing it um I suppose if you'd asked me 10 years ago where I expected to be in 10, 10 years, um, yeah, I would, I, I would, I, I would never have imagined, you know, I'd, I'd, I'm not sure I'd still, I would have imagined then that I'd still be doing it. So I'm, I'm very grateful that I am still able to do it. And um, I, I wouldn't have imagined that I'd have uh, done some books where I illustrated myself. I wouldn't have imagined that I'd just have written a series about robots, you know? So I think um, it's great to have, you know, the different things that I've been able to do. And um, I mean, one of the best things, again, that I probably wouldn't have imagined that 10 years ago, one of the best things of my experience the last 10 years has been visiting schools. You know, I spent a lot of time, or I did before the lockdown, spend a lot of time visiting schools and, um, you know, meeting readers, doing workshops. And, and that, again, has been such a privilege to actually get out there and meet the people that you're writing for. And, uh, you know, and yes, yeah, sometimes it's hard. Um, sometimes sitting at home trying to write stories is hard, you know, um, and, you know, trying to get those stories published can be very, very difficult and can be demoralising, you know, um, and there are, you know, elements of being an author and being in this industry that get you down. We all know that, you know, it's tough. Um, and there are elements of being a published author that I imagined that haven't quite happened, you know, um, and sometimes, you know, those are disappointing. But, you know, the kind of good stuff, 
the you know the emails that you get from readers and the you know the response you get talking to readers yeah it just kind of makes up for it and you know that's that's the important stuff because i mean like you know i kind of started writing probably the same as you did the same as most of us do because we we love books and books mean something to us and to have you know to have readers email me and and, and parents of readers email me and tell me you know how much one of my books has meant to them is just like you know pff, wow you know that's uh yeah that makes it all worthwhile i suppose really so um I'm interested to kind of flip that one round because, you know, kind of you've just had your first book published. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Where, you know, where do you see yourself in 10 years? Oh, well, that's, it is a tricky one because it is tricky to imagine. But <laughs> what I hope like, with regards to my writing would be to complete the Necropolis series and get that out there, particularly as the feedback I'm getting is about people wanting the sequel because I have left it on a bit of a cliffhanger. <laughs> um, but equally to still be writing and be writing a complete variety of things because I'm currently writing a fantasy as well so hopefully have that series out there and being enjoyed by readers and equally helping people with my writing because I do a lot of writing about personal experiences and personal challenges so fingers crossed in 10 years time I'll still be doing it and doing it across a wide variety of arenas and different genres, different avenues, and hopefully using my writing to help people. That would be the ultimate goal. Brilliant, brilliant. So you, you say at, at the moment you're, you're writing the sequel to Necropolis. Yeah. And a fantasy novel at the same time. I am, yes. Wow. How are you yeah. finding that, kind of splitting the two stories at once, working on two things at once? It's quite useful because it gives me a break from one when all the ideas in the sequel to Necropolis have got me going all over the place and I don't really know what direction I'm going. I can just leave it, walk away, spend some time with all the fairies and all the magical creatures <laughs> in my fantasy and then come back to it with a fresh pair of eyes, which is certainly useful. Yeah, yeah. Do, do you find actually in a strange way the two stories start informing each other in a way or...? Or are they very def very separate, definitely? They're definitely very separate stories, but they do help me come up with ideas for the others when I think of something quite generic, but it wouldn't fit with the one I'm currently working on. Mm. So then I can just make a note and use it when I go back to the other, which is quite handy. Yeah. Cool, cool. So is, uh, you said you, your dad's kind of demanded a follow-up to uh, Necropolis, so is he kind of uh, badgering you for it? Without a doubt, but it's quite handy where he's been. He was the beta reader for Necropolis. So I'm using him as the beta reader for the sequel. So he's got the first, where I'm halfway through, he's got the first, well, I think he's got 40,000 words to read and see if he thinks it's going in the right direction. So Good. Is, he, he, is he a tough critic? He can be, yes. But if he's going to demand I'm doing it, then I'll put him to work with it. <laughs> Oh, so I think we are coming up to the end of our time for this section of our interview, although we do have some more questions to ask in the green room once we finish the live on Instagram. So for anyone watching, you can check that out with the YouTube video or with the podcast afterwards. But before we sign off, we want to discuss what your what's going on next for the book chain project so episode five is yourself being the interviewer and changing roles so i wanted to ask who you're interviewing when it will be going live and then we've got to think of what question we think they should be asked okay well um yeah the next uh, link in the chain will be me interviewing um andrina kodani uh, about her excellent book uh, the girl who and um, that's we're actually having a break, so there isn't there isn't a book chain next week. So I'm going to be interviewing Andrea, Andrea, Andrina, sorry, Andrina, apologies, uh, on April the seventh. Uh, I think it's going to be at seven thirty. And um, yeah, I've I've got lots of questions to ask her about about this. In, in fact, one of the questions I'd like to ask her about there's actually um, there are three narrators in in this, and, and so I'm really interested in how she coped with with that because handling three first person narrators can be really really difficult you know kind of getting the different voices and getting into each of their heads um so I, that's one of the questions that i'd like to ask her but i don't know bethan have you got a question 
that was exactly really? the question I was thinking of. Yeah, because it's something particularly I'm, I write most of, well, most of my writing is done third person. So first person narration is something I find quite difficult writing anyway. And then to juggle the different narrators is something that I haven't finished it yet, but I'm thoroughly enjoying her, her work. But the idea of writing with the different voices is mm. something I, I do think would be quite a challenge. So I'll be interested to hear how she finds it. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. And, and we, we, we didn't set that up or anything, did we? That was totally no, genuine. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. fantastic. Fantastic. So, yeah. So look out for that on April the 7th. Yes. Yeah, so two weeks today. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. I will definitely be there. And thank you so much for joining me for our interview this evening, Dave. It's been lovely to chat to you and talk more about my robots gone wild, which for anyone watching or listening, definitely worth picking up because I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a very different angle. It wasn't what I expected. The play on words of the title it could lead to so many different <laughs> avenues. So I really did enjoy it. Um, definitely recommend it to anyone out there. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Bethan. Cool, and thank you everyone for joining us. Yeah. Cheers, folks. Bye bye. She's facing zombies, ghosts, witches, and hellhounds with nothing but her wits and a talking cat. It's a bad day for Ivy. Raising Hell by Bryony Pierce, out June 2021. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, like and share and tune in in two weeks when Dave Cousins will be interviewing Andrina Cordani, author of The Girl Who, which I am just about to finish and I love. Bye. One, two, three.